Welcome to this presentation number 12 in the course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. In this session, I'm going to talk about human capacity and development strategy in three sections. First of all, about human capacity. Secondly, about neoliberal promises. And thirdly, about development strategy. The overall thematic question here is, in development terms, why has human capacity proven itself more important than natural resources, which loom much larger in the neoliberal uh, view of the world? And here we'll look at also the, the UN's Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals and consider to what extent they assist <clears throat> in pursuing these ideas of development strategy. The set readings are set out there and they're in PDF form on the website that you can link through the, uh, through the video. So first of all, on human capacity, a little revision from session two, where I talked about human development. The UNDP idea these days, since the 90s, is that human capabilities are at the root of development, an idea that's most famously expounded by the economist Amartya Sen. As a whole, human capabilities can expand the overall human capacity of a society. Now, human development in this sense from the UNDP and from Mahbubul Haq, the Pakistani economist who uh, popularized the Human Development Index. Human development is about enlarging choices. It's about human outcomes compared to the idea of financial means. So it's an alternative to, as Al Haq saw it, to the more uh, economistic view of GDP as a measure of social progress and social development. So from that human development uh, idea, we have the Human Development Index. We have a wide range of human development indicators and we have this concept of expanding human capabilities, which Sen spoke of as beings and doings. Now, notice here the difference between human capital, an idea which is commonly used in, in talking about development and education, and human capability. The definition I've given you there below <clears throat> from Sen is that human capital is really the agency of human beings, their education and training, which helps in augmenting production possibilities. So an investment in people that contributes to production. Human capability, on the other hand, is about the ability of human beings to lead lives they have reason to value and to enhance their substantive choices. So it's not exactly the same thing. There's an important difference there. Now, there are other approaches to the capabilities idea. I'll mention a few of them here. Uh, where Sen didn't really define capabilities. Others like uh, Martin Nussbaum do, including, for example, concepts of justice. There are others like Streeton who talk about capabilities as uh, fulfilling basic needs. But even here, there's argument about what basic needs are. There is a discussion of capabilities, human capabilities as collective capabilities. That is to say there are shared um, uh, capabilities such as a clean environment, for example. And going beyond Sen's methodological individualism, where he's talking about people individually expanding their capabilities, we have Nolan and Stewart criticizing that, um, talking about the critical role of social institutions and others, including myself, talking about the role of the state, the human development role of the state in enabling human development. So development, of course, is to some considered a, an expression of independence because actual human development can represent independence in that it breaks from colonial underdevelopment and therefore development is closely linked to the idea of a self-determination of a people. The better human development achievements in recent decades have been seen precisely in China and Iran, the top two in human development index progress between 1990 and 2017. The UNDP in its 2018 report tells us that, that in the high human development band, China and Iran have made the most uh, consistent progress. China, of course, through its remarkable economic growth, um, but also that has passed on into education, for example. The, the HDI is a composite of uh, life expectancy, a, a measure of health, uh, uh, two measures of uh, education and uh, GDP. So it includes income. And Iran, in that case, has made remarkable advances, consistent advances in education um, and also in health and child health in particular. Some resource poor countries, which I'll look at in a moment, have made remarkable advances by heavily investing in their people and developing unique skills and industries. I mention this because it's important to see that development is not necessarily tied to um, resource extraction. <clears throat> 
the UNTB data uh, is important because it recasts economic development as human development in the way that I've described. And it often provides a useful mean of arbitrating international controversies. For example, when the, the US President Donald Trump was talking about the failure of the Iranian revolution uh, in the very same year, we could go to the UNDP and see that the, there had been these remarkable advances in health and child health and education in Iran in the previous four decades. But human development ideas have not resolved the means of advancing hum, human capabilities. So we should look at some particular experiences to see uh, what the possibilities are for advancing this human capacity in a broad sense of the word. I've chosen here three countries which are, have some distinct uh, achievements in that they are all resource poor, um, former colonies um, or former colonies and war damaged nations. So Japan, which was not a former colony, but it was destroyed physically in World War II from wartime ruins and with very few natural resources. Japan for many centuries has not been able to feed itself. It doesn't have enough energy for its own needs until it developed nuclear energy. But it became a leading industrial power after World War II, from the 50s through to the 80s at least, until its economic stagnation in the 90s. Now, how did Japan do that? I ask rhetorically. I'll come back at the end. Singapore was a former colony with next to no natural resources, even imports fresh water from Malaysia. And now it has OECD living standards. In fact, it was one of the, probably the first former colony to break through into having uh, very high living standards like OECD or European countries. How did Singapore do that? Cuba, a former colony and a neo-colony under economic blockade from the US for the last 60 years, is now the largest trainer of doctors in the world and has amazing uh, large health um, missions to help other countries. How did it do that under those sorts of circumstances? Now, you notice these are very politically diverse systems and not just politically, but political economically also. For example, Cuba is a socialist country. Japan is a capitalist country or a corporate capitalist country. Uh, but they had some common strategic elements. Um, what were they, I ask rhetorically. I'm going to go on to, to answer that. But by contrast, the countries which relied on natural resource extraction as opposed to the development of human resources, investing in their people, which is the point about the previous three countries. Those countries which have relied on their natural resources and haven't invested heavily in their people are often stuck in resource dependency and relatively restricted human development. And this table from the UNDP um, in 2013, as it happens, it's a useful um, table. It talks about the gross national income, which is like gross domestic product, a little bit different, minus the human development index ranking. And that gives us a measure of um, effectively the efficiency of the use of resources for human development. In other words, if the, if the score is very positive, as in the left side of this table, where you've got Cuba, Georgia, Samoa, Cameroon, Cameroon, Madagascar, and so on, it means that the relative human development is quite high compared to the resources they have. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side, it's the reverse. Countries that are in minus scores, particularly in serious large minus scores, are making very poor uh, advances in human development measured by the HDI um, compared to the resources they have. And you notice on that right hand side there, you have a lot of oil exporters, a lot of oil countries like Kuwait, Oman and so on, Angola, Qatar, Botswana. In week six on independent small nations, when we were talking about East Timor, we saw that none of the best performers in the left column here um, in terms of uh, HDI to income efficiency had large oil resources, but almost all of the world, the worst performers did. And that, of course, doesn't matter to foreign investors who want to make money out of, in the short term in particular, out of particular economies, but it matters to the people within those countries to the extent that uh, improvements in life expectancy, education, and, and uh, generalized income are important. Now, this may not be an inevitable oil curse, it's sometimes it's sometimes called an oil curse, that really there's some uh, curse that sits over anyone with uh, valuable natural resources because there are some exceptions and there are ways out, in particular with some political will to industrialise and develop other, develop other capacities. But it does show some, some common dangers of extractivism, reliance on extracting um, natural resources really is a, um, is a trap in which a lot of countries fall.
So the dilemmas of resource-based strategies in small island nations. Here we've got a particular category of countries. There's quite a large number of them. There's dozens of them in the world out of around 200 countries. So a few dozen are small island states. Here's a little one, a little country called Nauru with a population of only about 10,000. Now they had a huge phosphate industry which effectively destroyed the ecology of their island. And they used it really, you know, with the advice of the, the big corporate powers and the neoliberal states in the world to invest in a version of a sovereign wealth fund, Nauru House, a big building in Melbourne, Australia, which eventually, um, their debts mounted to such an extent that that house was stolen off, uh, sold off to others. And later, the little country of Nara was driven to um, sell itself for things such as a detention centre for Australia's unwanted asylum seekers. So that's a cautionary tale, but there have been other sovereign wealth funds from typically from oil resources, which have variable records, but there's a danger in uh, it's very difficult to manage um, a fund that's put aside supposedly for future generations. It often doesn't happen. It gets pilfered, it gets um, used up. Uh, Timor-Leste is a similar case in the sense that there was a sovereign wealth fund there, a petroleum fund, but it was uh, dug into by successive governments um, a decade after independence and it was reduced at an unsustainable rate. Staying with the small island state issue, uh, is this question of investing in human capabilities or in an overall sense we could call human capacity. Now, here's a table that shows us more broadly that small island states have actually made relatively heavy investments in higher education. In other words, they're aware of the fact that their young people are the future and that they have to invest in their young people. So you see from the small island state, um, a small island developing country average there, we've got a little bit better than world average figures in terms of secondary enrollment, but much better uh, than world average in terms of tertiary enrollment, the one that I've outlined in red there. Um, it comes up to uh, almost the high human development mark. Uh, that is to say, a lot of their young people are going to college, going to university there. And that's something that I suppose is, is struck home to small islands. They realise there are limited resources and they know that the investing in their people is an important issue. Here we have another example. It's a famous long-term example, the Indian state of Kerala. We have a, a, a state within a very large uh, federation uh, with a somewhat different history. So if we look at the Indian literacy in the colonial period, we see it was very poor. Whatever else the British did for India, they certainly didn't send many people to school. Literacy at the time of independence in 1947 was around 12%, um, very low. Whereas Kerala, a little bit after that, was already 47% and women were at 36%. So we can see that even in the colonial period, there was something different going on in the state of Kerala. And that's important uh, these days when we see the other social advantages of having a well-educated population. So we see for these figures only go up to 2001, but Indian literacy increased quite strongly after independence for all of the failures of governments after independence. There was a much stronger development in adult literacy than there had been in the colonial period up to what's not very impressive today, 65% in 2001. But in Kerala at that same time, it was over 90% and almost gender equity. The women were 87, almost 88% there. If we look ahead a little bit now to a measure of human development in Kerala and India, here's a very interesting chart. It shows us that in, term, in terms of income per capita, and this is an older figure of the late 90s, but the example is a historical one and it's just as strong today. Um, the income, average income in Kerala and India is almost the same, almost exactly the same, no real difference there. But look at the difference um, in some of the other indicators. The life expectancy in Kerala uh, back at that time in the late 90s was 12 years more. Infant mortality was 14 compared to 68, it was uh, almost a quarter of uh, babies dying. Male and female um, literacy, much higher in Kerala. Underweight children, much less. Uh, houses with toilet facilities, much higher. Houses with safe water, uh, sorry, that should be uh, unsafe water, um, were better also. Gender disparity, much, much less. 
So notice there the links between education, health and gender equity. Safe water is the wrong, it should be unsafe water. That is to say, with higher levels of education, you have a number of associated, we don't say there's an exact, exact causal relationship, but it seems like there is some sort of relationship because in income terms, there's no real difference between the Indian average and Kerala. But when you take into account the much higher levels of education, we see health, uh, critical health uh, differences, significant differences, and even some infrastructural uh, advantages. Here's another general uh, feature of the education of women and girls. Why is it so important? And it's recognized widely in people that study development these days. It's not a controversial thing, but there's a particularly good study which was commissioned by the World Bank. Um, the World Bank has its own interests, but often its research is relatively independent. In this case, a study by, uh, by uh, Jia Wang and others in 1999 was comparing, looking at 115 countries and looking at the different uh, improvements in income made to certain human development uh, factors like children dying, uh, male and female adult, adult mortality, uh, life expectancy and the fertility rate, how many babies women were having. And they said, yes, there's a difference. Uh, when income rises, you have improvements in some of these elements. But when the education of adult females rises, you have uh, also improvements, often much greater improvements. And what they called everything else, which was the utilization of new technology, new knowledge, new systems, for example, also played an important part there. So let's have a look for a moment at how relatively important are education of women and money for critical health improvements. You see that for a given in, uh, improvement in income, you had, say, a 17%, uh, it contributed a certain amount to the improvement under, under five mortality rates to 17% of the total, whereas more than double the improvement came about through the education of adult females. And this is looking across 115 countries, so taking account of many other differences in culture and social systems there. So we can say that the education of women was more than twice as important to reduce child mortality, and you can see the common sense in that, in the sense that educated mothers know things about hygiene, they know things about illness, they know things about looking after their children, nutrition, a range of things like that. It, it makes sense that, that well-educated mothers um, are better at looking after the health of their children and, and avoiding the death of their children. Also, if you look at women's mortality rate, that is to say, better educated women certainly um, live longer, basically. Um, if they if they had more income it would help too but it was more helpful twice as helpful in this study um, to be well educated it was less of a difference for men uh, living longer as you might expect men might do their own things in terms of damaging their healths and the education of women had much less to do with that but in other words with children male and female with women the education of women was very important female life expectancy um, uh, at birth uh, also greater, male life expectancy at birth also greater. Why? Because the women are looking after the, the male children. And another one, this is a very important, the total fertility rate, that is to say how many babies women were having. Um, it's true to some extent that an increase in income leads to less babies, that is to say uh, wealthier people tend to control their fertility to a degree, but better educated women is by far and away the strongest factor uh, leading to the reduction of having very, very large families. And this is much more important than religion or any other type of factor that might influence the, the use of contraception. When women are educated, they control, they look after their own fertility, they know what's going on, they know how to find out to control their fertility and have some semblance of um, family planning. So this is why um, this is one uh, lot of data which illustrates a more commonly accepted point these days is that the women, the education of women and girls has a much wider uh, social impact. It's not just on their own health and their own um, uh, livelihoods, but it affects society much more broadly.
And when we speak of building human capacity, it's important we observe a difference between training and education. Sometimes the often the two are mixed together that, and, and sometimes education uh, is considered to be training in some respects, but there are differences, important differences. Um, first of all, training is really, it, whether it's a simple training or a complex training, you know, learning to be a dentist, for example, is a very complex training, but it's learning to do particular skills or a set of skills, basically. Whereas education is a type of systematic learning that develops a sense of judgment and reason. That is to say, there is creative elements to it and critical elements to it. So here, one uh, group called the Peak Performance Centre put together a table to try and make the difference, uh, point out the differences between the two, that training was about the pursuit of ability, education was the pursuit of knowledge, uh, and so on training improved performance and productivity, whereas education was developing a sense of reasoning and judgment. To some extent, we can put education or link education to uh, another measure that's been spoken of a lot these days, higher level literacy. Um, sometimes people think of higher education as this is something that's going to get you a better job. But more important than that, it's something that's going to develop a sense of higher literacy, and including things like um, a sense of reasoning and judgment. So education might be, uh, it must be more than simple rote learning or memorizing things. Uh, it, there may be elements of memorization in certain fields of education, certainly, um, but it must be more than that. And this difference matters most when there is change uh, socially or workplace change. If someone is uh, educated or trained for a particular job, that's simple enough to understand. But what happens these days typically is people's vocations uh, their workplace changes and workplaces themselves change too. Uh, another final point on this is that the workplaces or let's say the employers also, um, whether it's public sector or private sector or community sector, they often employ training, that is to say they train their staff, but they rarely engage in broader education. They rely for that on education systems, the school systems particularly or universities. Here's a graph from the OECD, which makes that point, I think, very strongly. And this was a report done uh, back in 2013, looking at the, uh, it's a skills outlook. So it's, um, uh, it starts by thinking about training, basically, but it's really about how uh, level, higher level literacy assists in terms of social and workplace change. So in this, um, in this survey, they found that 34% of workers, a third of workers, reported structural changes in their workplace, and 42% reported new ways of working in their work workplace. And so the study was to see how would those workers be able to adapt with those sorts of changes depending on their levels of education. And here they divided up, and I've just selected some of the, the countries, some of the OECD countries from uh, the, uh, the uh, much wider group. Um, they divided up literacy into several levels below level one. In other words, there are some very basic levels of literacy where people can, um, you know, send a text message or read the price on something. And then there are high levels of literacy. Um, here, I'll put the definitions at the bottom there. Level one was, quote, to read relatively short texts to locate a single piece of information that is identical to the information given to understand basic vocabulary, to determine the meaning of sentences and read continuous texts with some degree of fluency. Whereas at the other end, the highest level, level four and five literacy, was to, to uh, quote, perform multi-step operations to integrate, interpret, or synthesize information from complex texts that involve conditional and or competing information, and to make complex inferences and appropriately apply background knowledge as well as interpret or evaluate subtle truth claims. Now, this is really, in many respects, a definition of the skills that are looked for in higher education and universities, for example. So if you look at the way that's been measured across these countries, and they're all uh, fairly wealthy countries, you see there are some significant differences. If you look at level four, for example, you will see that some countries are, like, for example, Finland has 20% in that higher band, or 22% if we had level five. Whereas Italy, three and a half, three point four percent, so much, much different. And if you look at those differences, Spain much lower, also four point seven percent in level four and five. And the question there is, you know, who is going to do better when these changes, these social and structural changes, and changes in the workplace happen? So here's the importance of high level lit literacy for 
individual and collective improvement in human capability and overall human capacity. So let's move to the second section, neoliberal promises. And here we're talking about the promises of hegemonic neoliberalism, which are typically based on generalized economic growth, or sometimes called broad-based growth, which accounts for the fact that uh, they recognize the problems of big reliance on one industry, for example. Um, but a growth which benefits huge Western corporations. And there have been some neoliberal adaptations to this idea um, to incorporate um, recognition of the human development agenda, for example, and we'll see this particularly when we come to the UN's Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. So the neoliberal means have effectively have been put into the, the, the way by which those aims might be achieved. Thirdly, the failures of corporate aid or development corporation. Um, fourthly, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. And finally, the failures of neoliberalism in even the most wealthy countries, in particular the US. And I want to start by showing a short video on the problems of healthcare in the US. This is from Newsweek in 2018. It's recognizing what's uh, spoken of in many, many articles and analyses in recent decades that the US spends far more on health than any other country, far more um, in general, far more per capita spending than any other country, but has very poor health outcomes. So here's a, a classic example of how more in terms of economic spending is not better value. The system does work, of course, for the corporate health industry in the US. They make a lot of money out of it, but it doesn't work in terms of the public health outcomes. The US has no universal health care. According to the Congressional Budget Office, nearly 26 million Americans remain uninsured. Across the rest of the world, health care is very different. Some European countries have publicly funded health care, like the UK's National Health Service. In Japan, insurance is often provided by the employer and medical fees are regulated. In the US, it costs around $9,500 a year for health care. 17% of US GDP is spent on both private and public health care, more than any other developed country in the world. Sweden spent just under 12%, while the UK is much lower at 9%. However, a mere 48% of that expenditure comes from the government, while Sweden, Japan, and the UK all spend more than 80%. If the US spends more of its GDP on healthcare, surely it should be better, right? Well, according to data from the World Bank, the life expectancy of Americans has not improved as much as those living in other developed nations. With a life expectancy of 79.3 years, Americans live shorter lives than people in 30 other countries. So some conceptual revision. Hegemonic neoliberalism, it is not really a philosophy, but a political pro a project and a process with defined aims, which is implicitly mainly to do with corporate privilege, benefiting large corporations in the name of economic growth, which might at some stage trickle down or flow down to other parts of the society, and flexible methods, that is to say, while often the free market ideas of economic liberalism are called on, they're not uh, ne by any means necessarily um, fixed means. Uh, and people sometimes talk about the, the contradictions within this system of neoliberalism, but really to me it's better thought of as a political project which doesn't have a fixed methods and fixed um, ideology. Globalist intervention, uh, necessarily hegemonic, versus inclusive globalization, which is something that's spoken of in some of the UN agencies, like the UNDP, for example. We have to recognize that there are these competing concepts of globa um, globalization and globalism, for example, these days. Economic power through strong states and multinational corporations typically combines in a hegemonic project with military um, uh, capacity to advance the interests of their investors using aid, sanctions and various other interventions. So there is a combination of uh, economic with political and military power used to advance these hegemonic uh, projects. The countervailing factors that come along are that, that is to say, uh, forces which uh, to some extent uh, counter and to some extent compensate for that power are independent states in particular, where there are independent states, these are the things that 
the big power is most intolerant of, and particularly regional blocs when those independent states get together, like the BRICS group, like the ALBA and the CELAC group in Latin America, uh, within countries, trade unions, social movements, general resistance uh, currents, countervailing factors are important to account for because while big power exists, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, it has resistance. And it's very important to try and uh, account for this resistance. Human development is systematically undermined by neoliberalism, so significant political will is required to create these sort of independent countercurrents. So they don't just happen by themselves. Neoliberal aid uses rewards and discipline. It talks about a type of uh, a charitable approach to the rest of the world uh, to compensate for those less well off, but typically it's become corporate welfare in most of its expressions. Uh, it combines with diplomacy and other forms of leverage, and it's much, much less concerned with peripheral development or the development of the actual countries, supposedly the recipients of aid. There are new rights-based norms which might either reinforce or weaken the neoliberal project. For example, this uh, new idea, well, it's a rebadged old idea, hegemonic humanitarian intervention that existed in the 19th century, but it's been updated in some respects, and that's something that certainly undermines the sovereignty of new nations, for example. But on the other hand, there's an autonomous right to development spoken of in, in UN circles these days, which has the, the capacity to give greater legitimacy to the claims for autonomy and independence. So these are some of the concepts we have to work with in looking at uh, the neoliberal project or hegemonic neoliberalism. Briefly, in summary of the outcomes of the neoliberal era, which we can date from the late 1970s onwards, really, until um, the present day, um, the impact of neoliberal corporate privilege on socioeconomic rights has been um, a mixed bag, but with a lot of downside features. That is to say, expropriation, rationalisation of available lands, food insecurity, very expensive new medicines with the increasing uh, strength of uh, patent laws, for example, and vulnerability to shocks. With globalisation, it's more difficult to remain aloof from some of the, the big changes in the world, such as the fluctuation in the prices of food, for example, which I spoke of in the week on food security. The privatisation and contamination of accessible clean water is a significant um, human quality of life problem these days. The commercialisation of health and education is not just about um, the problems of access to health and education, but the nature of that health and education. And the disempowerment and marginalisation of labour rights in these increasing um, so-called free trade zones. We also have the normalisation of intervention and war. Um, the the notion of interventions in the name of humanitarian intervention, destabilisation proxy wars, which are typically aimed at control of whole regions and control of resources, but often using human rights themes. These are new dilemmas in a sense because they have been rebadged to make them more palatable to the post-colonial era, which typically should be and 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 in in norm in terms of norms and international law has been emphasising the independence and sovereignty of nations, but this has been undermined by some of these new conventions. We have countervailing themes, um, the idea of a developmental state from the East Asian experience, which is about the, a stronger role of the state, counter to the neoliberal idea in economic development. We have this idea of a right to development coming out of the United Nations, which stresses independent states, um, contrary to the neoliberal project, stresses participation, uh, one of the key social democratic values, and distinct paths towards the aims of the right to education, the right to health. And we have this strategic um, counter doctrine, the multipolarity, a counter hegemonic doctrine, which has been adopted by a lot of um, states that are want to maintain their independence from a US dominated world versus the idea of unipolarity, which is really another name for hegemonic stability, where you have a global policeman contrary to all of the um, international norms and international law, uh, potentially new spaces for human development in this multipolar world. In education generally, the very weak neoliberal commitment to free education, it's there formally, but it's undermined by the fact that neoliberalism has always promoted this idea of user pays, that it is better for people in some behavioural sense that they pay for education, the families pay for their children's education, for example. 
And uh, there was a UN rapporteur on this, um, the late Katerina Tomasevsky, who did a report in 2006 on the state of the right to education worldwide, free or fee. And she pointed out that the fact that primary education is free in the wealthy countries, in the OECD, while charges are le levied in the poor countries, contradicts the ideals which inspired making education a universal human right. In other words, she's saying the wealthy countries which promote this idea of user pays in their own societies because of internal struggles in their own societies have in many cases, not in all, but in many cases have uh, eliminated fees for particularly primary education, but they still uh, press it on families in poor countries through their aid programs and their other forms of leverage. Uh, Tomasevsky says that free and compulsory education for all the world's children, and she means under 18 by talking about children, forms the backbone of international human rights law, but it does not shape global educational strategies. And the reason for that is principally the, the norms of ne the neoliberal project that are constantly pushing this idea of um, user pays and um, the benefit of families and people, individuals are paying for their own uh, way in the world, that they, if their human capability or their human capital is going to be improved, they should pay for it. We have another important feature, which is the brain drain, which is a big factor in developing countries. Um, it's important, but there's a debate about how important. And um, to some people, it's extremely important. Uh, if we see some of the views from the wealthy countries, uh, it's often downplayed, uh, particularly through economic discourse, which tries to put up the whole remittances question. That is to say, the the sending of money back to families in developing countries by highly skilled workers um, is said to be a compensating measure. The World Bank promotes that idea in particular. But here we have at the top one US academic, Dr. Melissa Siegel, who argues that the migration of a highly skilled is not necessarily a bad thing. She means the emigration from poorer countries to wealthier countries. That's typically the path of, of most migration these days. She argues that the migration of skilled workers can help with the transfer of technology, values and remittances. There's nothing wrong with skilled migration, she says. A fairly extreme view in some senses. Uh, another US academic, Dr. Amelia Constant, admits there's a real loss in developing countries from the brain drain. That is to say, poorer countries losing um, their skilled people, their doctors, their engineers, um, a lot of investment made in those people, uh, supposedly to benefit their societies and then they leave and there's a, a loss not just in terms of individuals but there's a social loss there but she also argues that remittances if they uh, those wealthy emigrants send money back to their families that compensates to some extent for this bleeding she recognizes there's a loss there and that as i said is also the world bank view but that is what you might expect because the world bank is essentially a foreign investment club in developing countries, however, the view is rather different, and the Cubans in particular call it brain theft, not a brain drain, el robo de cerebro, as they say, because wealthy countries have many active programs to actually poach well-trained people, especially doctors, from developing countries. And that applies in particular to the US, uh, which has a program to offer incentives for um, Cuban-trained doctors to emigrate to the US and then of course, the US doesn't have to pay the cost of educating those doctors within the US system. They recognize their qualifications in Cuba, and after they go through a few tests, they will you know, elevate them to US trained doctors. Well, um, in the Solomon Islands, um, a small Pacific island with a population of about uh, a bit over half a million, maybe 600,000, uh, the the brain drain is seen in a much more concrete way. And here's a short video from a senior health official some years ago, uh, Dr. Cecil Alapendava, who says that the Solomon Islands used to graduate five to 10 doctors every year, often perhaps usually through scholarships from Australia and New Zealand. So assistance in education, but at a fairly low level, keeping the, the, the status of doctors in, in those Pacific Island countries at a fairly elite level. But the Solomon Islands used to lose them at about the same rate by emigration to wealthy countries. In other words, they graduate five or ten, lose five or ten because they, th those individuals, uh, typically young people, would see better futures in uh, a whole range of, uh, of wealthy countries. And they would be welcomed into those wealthy countries through skilled migration schemes. 
Um, but the doctor says that only with the large Cuban training program, doctor training program from 2006 onwards, with 90 plus scholarships, it ended up around about 100, has the country been able to increase its overall doctor population? So here's an example of what the Cubans were talking about. It's not, uh, you have to allow for the fact there's going to be some drain and try and build in some features into the training, including uh, elements of values that doctors are serving society as as salaried professionals rather than private businesses and you may minimize the brain drain but there's always going to be some sort of brain drain here's the video from dr cecil we over the decade we have um produced roughly around exactly around 130 uh, doctors in solomon islands uh, but unfortunately, half of them are serving in regional countries, as well as in United States and in Europe. So we have roughly about 60 doctors serving in Solomon Islands. So our, our population ratio is roughly about one doctor to nine or 10,000 people. Although we train around five to 10 per year, we lose at the same rate. So in reality, there, there is no build-up. There is a constant number all along. Currently, because of that cooperation signed, we have so far sent 90 students uh, in Cuba. The first lot are doing fourth year, third lot, uh, second lot are doing third year, third lot are doing second year, and uh, the fourth lot are doing first year. So we, we have found that the students are doing fairly well. So we come to what extent aid or development cooperation, as it's called these days, is a solution. The global aid industry is a huge industry, um, over 160 billion US dollars per year these days. Uh, the Australian contribution, to give you one side of it, from my country is about 2.6 billion, about 1.6% of that. And most of that Australian program has traditionally gone to Australian companies to provide services in developing countries or infrastructure projects, for example, often called boomerang aid. Even though it's very unpopular, if you tell uh, the Australian population about this, they don't like it. Here's some surveys on that. First of all, the Australians, when they've been surveyed, have said that the aid's budget is, they think it's much bigger than it is. They think it's maybe 15 times bigger than it is, let's say 14 or 15 percent of, of the of the total federal budget when it's less than 1%. Um, and they think it should be about 10 times what it is actually. So there's a misconception about how much aid there is, but still there's a, a broad sort of support for it. And when they're asked about the aims of it, the, the general uh, opinion in Australia is that they think most people, three quarters think that it should be to help reduce poverty in poor countries. On other occasions when they've been asked whether it should help large Australian companies deliver projects, they're against that. They, they like the simple idea of um, it's about helping reduce poverty in poor countries. Um, but of course, that's not really what happens. The failures of aid contrast very strongly with the type of idealism that uh, ordinary people see in wealthy countries there. Um, and the main problem is really that it's basically um, corrosive of processes of self-determination and democratic development. If there's long-term aid, I'm talking about long-term and not emergency aid, it's never going to be accountable. The people, local people will not have a say in where these roads or bridges go, or whatever it is, what the programs are. They will be given as some sort of outside charity. And for all the talk about participation and whatever, it's really going to be, there's going to be no democratic accountability. And that's worse, of course, the longer the project goes on for. In terms of self-governance, a long-term project which gradually undoes the damage of colonialism, this is self-governance, um, that colonialism crippled the growth of human personality, it blocked the development of indigenous public institutions, it created dependent social structures and aggravated poverty inequality, political independence and resistance to intervention remains the central means of def defending that healing process after the colonial period, but aid does not help in that. Now we've seen some uh, a series of studies really going back many, many decades. Um, a couple of interesting ones from the IMF in 2005, 2007, 
uh, one by Masud and Yoncevis, found that bilateral aid did not reduce infant mortality at all. That is to say, aid from one country to another, from a wealthy country to a developing country, didn't reduce the most critical health outcome, babies dying in their first 12 months at all. They were a little bit shocked by this. You notice, by the way, here that the IMF as an economic agency is incorporating a human development measure here, infant mortality, as a benchmark, a very good thing, really. So they commissioned another study uh, two years later, which found Mishra and Newhouse, 2007, which found that doubling health aid could reduce infant mortality by 2%, a very small amount and not really uh, compensating for the, not matching the sort of aims of the Millennium Development Goals at that time. There's another factor here about aid and particularly long-term aid is something that I've written about and called aid trauma. It's about an inflationary enclave bubble economy where you have a little society where a lot of very wealthy people go in, um, foreign aid workers typically um, living in expensive hotels and so on, creating a double economy, a bubble economy, a double and bubble, where, for example, there's a whole different series of prices. Um, you know, for example, it's, it can be more expensive to rent a hotel room or hire a car in a developing country than it is in the wealthy country because that economy is catering for wealthy expatriates there. And of course, that crosses over with those involved in resource extraction industry, the oil industry and so on. So there are failures in human institutional capacity building and relative deprivation, inequality, which creates a trauma in society. And that's another problem of aid. Another point I've mentioned here at the top is that a lot of aid is also militarised, although conventionally the spending is separated out from so-called civilian aid. But if you look at USAID to Colombia, the most highly militarised Latin American state with, I think, nine US military bases now, the great bulk of the overall aid in blue in the graph there is in fact military aid. The foreign aid industry, though, remains very popular, largely because it suits Western self-image. That is to say, Western populations like to see themselves as um, generous and sharing and um, helping people who are less fortunate. This idea of um, perhaps noblesse oblige, you know, that people are not really, they're not really committed to um, democracy, but they like the idea of the fact that they, their wealth or their privileges can be shared in some sort of way. But the independent analysis over many, many decades has suggested chronic failure, and that includes um, failure of the bilateral aid and big projects, but also programs such as child sponsorship, which is probably the most popular form of foreign aid, but it's been criticised for decades. Uh, there's a very good report on it in the New Internationalist magazine in 1982, so almost 40 years ago. All the reasons why you should not sponsor a child, I'm not going to go into them now. The reference is there. You can look it up yourself. It's still online there. Nevertheless, it's an extremely popular program. And the root problem, as I said, of all of these near permanent aid programs are their utter failure in democracy. There is simply no accountability from these sorts of um, projects. If there's a local health system, potentially people can have a say in how the health system's operating. If it's an aid project, they won't have a say. There might be a consultation where some, someone comes along with a form, picks some boxes to report back to their funding body, but it's not democracy. The most likely benefit from aid comes from mass training, but that's rarely the, pr the priority of corporate welfare aid programs, which typically prefer, la prefer large infrastructure projects, dams, bridges, roads, those things that can be um, large profits can be extracted from it by the, the corporations which come in to do those, those programs. That's why I called it uh, corporate welfare beforehand. And ongoing service provision where you've got foreigners coming in and doing certain services as a type of permanent industry. Now, the other books I've mentioned there, Everyone Loves a Good Drought um, by Sainath and Aiding and Abetting the White Man's Burden are all references you might like to look at in terms of the failures of aid and the, the cataloguing of these historic failures of aid, the foreign aid industry. Along comes the UN projects of the 21st century, which incorporate human development measures, but then the neoliberal project tries to join with them to insert corporate agendas into those goals. And so the Millennium Development Goals, which ran from 2000 to 2015, had eight goals with 18 targets for 2015 on a, a baseline of data from 1990. The Sustainable Development Goals um, carried on that project but expanded and made it a little bit more complicated. 
from 2015 to 2030. So there are 17 goals there, 154 targets for 2030 with a baseline data of 2010. And some of them are very good. The aims, that is to say, are very good. For example, the MDG 55A reduced by three quarters between 1990 and 2015, the maternal mortality ratio. A very good aim, a very worthy aim, um, uh, an area of preventable deaths, which could be reduced by, for example, providing skilled assistance. We noticed talking about health systems, public health systems, that a skilled birth assistant was the key factor in reducing both infant and maternal mortality. So a worthy aim. But as the late Samir Amin said in 2006, many of those goals, each of those MDG goals, he said, is certainly commendable, but it is assumed without question that liberalism is perfectly compatible with the achievement of the goals. He means liberalism, corporate liberalism, that is to say economic liberalism. Yet the open and multilateral commercial and financial system is part of a series of discourses intended to legitimise the policies and practices implemented by dominant capital and those who support it. He's talking about the means of reaching those sorts of goals. So if we look, for example, at what was in the, in the Millennium Development Goals, the eighth goal, um, it, it was about global partnerships for development. Now, this was in the MDGs. This is where most of the neoliberal means were put into the project. Um, for example, in MDG 8, there was a couple that were, well, the first one was seemed apparently inoffensive, address the special needs of least developed countries, landlocked countries and small oil and developing states, which I mentioned before. Second, and here's some code language where you have to identify um, if you see these sorts of cliches, you have to identify where they come from to understand them fully. Develop further an open, rules-based, predictable, non-discriminatory trading and financial system. This is language literally lifted out of the World Trade Organization. So the World Trade Organization, which uh, effectively ground to a halt in terms of new agreements in the early 21st century, had these same expressions in there, and they were about a single rules-based system rejecting the demand of developing countries for a two-track system because the uh, developing countries said that the wealthy countries had a great historical advantage and that there should be special and differential treatment for developing countries so in a sense there was always a struggle over this idea of a, a rules-based system and what it meant there were also critiques i've mentioned before i think that the the rules particularly in terms of agriculture for example and food production were rigged in the sense that certain uh, wealthy countries were able to adjust their subsidies to avoid the regulatory frontier of, the, of that rules-based system. So here you have in the MDG 8 a, uh, an insertion of a very similar idea that was part of the WTO structure, which, which failed in many senses to, to live on and produce new opportunities. Three, dealing comprehensively with developing countries' debt. Yeah, very nice, but how to do it? Um, it was really something that was uh, spoken of a lot in the 80s and 90s, and the World Bank at, at the end of the 90s came up with this um, highly indebted poor countries initiative, which was another way of talking about structural adjustment programs, that is to say, where neoliberal uh, mechanisms were uh, almost directly enforced, or leverage was used to enforce those mechanisms on things like user pays and budgetary controls and the privatisation of public services and so on. Fourthly, in cooperation with pharmaceutical companies, provide access to affordable essential drugs in developing countries. Now, this is something that echoes the trade related intellectual property rights agreement and the, the, the TRIPS plus that the US was pushing for very strong patents to make sure that the big pharmaceutical companies, so called big pharma, were part of a move towards uh, ensuring the right to health in different countries. It militated against the, the commerce of generic drugs, for example, and tried to um, keep the commercialization of essential drugs on top of the development agenda. Uh, finally, in cooperation with the private sector, again, bringing the corporations in rather than seeing them as a liability or a downside to the development agenda, make available benefits of new technologies, especially information and communications. That means in neoliberal terms, that, for example, the idea of the transfer of technology was something which should normally happen, according to this ideology, through 
large multinational corporations commercially, basically. So you can see in end of G8, the, the sections I put in bold there are really uh, specific neoliberal agenda items that have already been run and it still exists in the World Trade Organization and the World Bank's highly indebted poor country initiative, HIP, HIPAC, and in the World Trade Organization's TRIPS and the agenda for even stronger intellectual property rights pushed by the US. The Sustainable Development Goals, which, which come about in 2015, extended that same project, but I think they became less influential, uh, in my opinion, uh, because they were more diffuse. There were 17 of them instead of eight. Um, they, were, they were more difficult to, to comprehend as a complicated set of goals. They had 154 targets and more of the corporate agenda issues were placed in there, as you might see by the fact that it's been reported that the corporate sector generally was satisfied with these goals. And that is to say, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of what they wanted to see in terms of the means of development, how, they, how those goals would be met. So for example, the, the SDGs speak of regulatory harmonization as was part of free trade agreement proposals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, for example. TRIPS Plus, a stronger version of intellectual property rights or patents was in there for large corporations with medicines, with software um, in, other, in other areas. The development partnerships or public-private partnerships, which was a name uh, adopted very strongly after 1999, when at a, the meeting of the IMF and World Bank, the, the use of the term privatisation, which had become so unpopular in the 80s and 90s through structural adjustment programs was abandoned. And the various versions of partnerships, development partnerships, public-private partnerships were far more at use. And it meant publicly subsidised private investment in infrastructure and services and so on. And also, in agribusiness and agriculture there. So the SDGs, I think though, as I say, it's my opinion that they are actually less influential these days because they've become more complicated and um, they don't really, uh, they're not able to be driven also by a, a body like the, the World Trade Organization, which is really um, in remission more or less. And you have some new uh, multilateral or let's say multipolar uh, groups like the BRICS and so on, the Latin American, regional organizations uh, which are which have some different priorities finally there are some alternatives to uh, in health for example and other areas um, in uh, in uh, software in uh, communications for example to the sustainable development goal corporate agenda we have some projects in a number of countries um, Venezuela has a very strong one, for example, about free software, the promotion of free software, for example, um, uh, generic medicines wherever possible, for example. Um, generic, generic medicines, notice also that the big corporations also control a section of the generic industry these days too. It's not simple as uh, patented and, and generics. There is also corporate generics. The, uh, the idea to revise World Bank determinations on a capacity to pay because where there is commercialization, of course, uh, it's inescapable in many senses. For example, the, what, uh, what price is a multinational corporation going to charge for an HIV AIDS um, treatment drug, for example? It will vary from a wealthy country to a poor country, but how is the price going to be set? Now, the World Bank's had a role in this based on capacity to pay. And there've been protests about how that's done, basically. Public health must include preventive and promotional programs because in the neoliberal view of things, health is really about treating sickness. And in public health systems, it's really about maintaining health and preventing sickness. So there are different priorities there in the way medicine is carried out, not just in terms of the prices of drugs. And finally, we've got addressing the brain drain or the brain theft uh, or the brain grab. In other words, how are skilled professionals um, to be maintained in those countries? Um, and one of the factors, of course, is upscaled education and training systems, basically. As the Cubans have demonstrated in doctor training, they say there's a, a doctor or a health worker shortage in the whole world, and there has to be upscaled training. But in many wealthy countries where private doctor associations control the agenda, they want to restrict entry to the profession, so they maintain 
the value of the, of the services that they typically sell as private businesses. Okay, to the third and final session part of this session, development strategies. And there are various different approaches to development in the world, and they all carry certain consequences. Um, to start with, there is this, what I call a passive engagement with neoliberal globalism. That is to say, a relatively weak approach where countries open themselves to attack by the big powers, for example, their idea, if they have it, of self-sufficient agriculture, it comes under attack and they're pushed into uh, export-oriented cash cropping. Their public institutions are targeted for privatisation. If they want to go and get loans for any sort of reason, this pressure comes in. User pays policies are promoted through various neoliberal pressures. State economic capacity is eroded, basically. Then there are those that depend on extractivism. They have the fortune of having some sort of oil or other mineral uh, or a phosphate or any other sort of natural resource and uh, it's wanted outside and so they're encouraged to depend on it but they neglect the human development and their resource dependent strategies almost all fail as I tried to show earlier on with the table. Thirdly, there's some political will required for sustained human, uh, human development investment and there are these proven strategies. We saw how Japan for example, which the US encouraged to stay in cheap labour production in the 50s, and the Japanese at that time, even though they were very subservient to the US, said, no thanks, we'd rather upgrade our industries and compete with your big industries. And as a result, we've got those very well-known industrial brands from Japan, the Toyotas, the Nikons, the Yamahas, all of those sorts of things that were not to do with cheap labour, but trying to climb to the top of the tree in terms of uh, value added. So political wills required in all of those sorts of um, sustained projects. Um, independent states, of course, have their problems if they're isolated and multipolarity or the idea of new independent power blocks helps provide some of those sorts of opportunities. So there are, in a sense, you might call it post-globalist opportunities with the, the um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, group which has had its ups and downs but nevertheless has some distinct priorities to the neoliberal um, project coming from the US and backed up in many respects by the European bloc. We have the Latin American groups uh, ALBA, the UNASUR and CELAC for example which are uh, in, in inculcate a lot of new autonomous elements to do with reliance on their internal networks in terms of finance, in terms of producing locally um, some of the essential things they need, including essential medicines and so on. Uh, protecting their cultures, for example, the Europeans do a bit of that too. So once there's a block, the possibilities of enhanced political will increase somewhat. And then there's a the question of defending those independent strategies. One thing to have the political will to try and implement them, but then to uh, defend them requires significant support at home, first of all, and then strong alliances. And all of that means really that the role of the state assumes a different importance in development than the way in which it's portrayed in neoliberal discussions. Not that the neoliberal countries themselves believe in weak states. Have you notice that the hegemonic stability theory is about a very strong state and every other state is very weak. That's the, the type of double standards that gets built into hegemonic neoliberalism. Well, then we have this project from the mid-80s in the UN, the UN General Assembly, which is largely former colonies, developing countries these days. The idea of a right to development. Now, this I've called a um, countervailing um, element in international relations because it has a number of elements which are in many respects distinct to the neoliberal agenda and more participatory, more social democratic if you like. For example, the idea that individuals participate in processes of development rather than development as a technical process where some sort of benefits are delivered by multinational corporations and we as consumers accept those sorts of benefits passively. The idea that individuals have equal opportunity of access to resources and not just um, to participate in a market. The idea that there should be a fair distribution of the benefits of development, it seems fairly a mild concept really, but there's a great deal of hostility 
in economic liberalism and neoliberalism to the idea of a fair distribution because it's markets that carry out this sort of distribution. If those markets are functioning properly with normal price mechanisms, not distorted by state subsidies and other regulations, then the market does it optimally. That's the neoliberal idea that has been picked up or borrowed from economic liberalism. But in this Right to Development Declaration of 1986, and it's just a declaration, it's not a treaty which has accountability mechanisms, there is this idea of fair distribution. The idea that states have the primary responsibility for the creation of conditions favourable to the realisation of the right to development is built in there. So the role of the state is enhanced as against the, the idea in neoliberalism that you have the state being an obstacle to the free functioning of markets, basically. Uh, a UN expert, Arjun Sen Gupta, spoke of the rights-based development as a participatory, non-discriminatory, accountable and transparent process. This is his summary of the declaration. With equity in decision making and sharing the fruits of progress and the primary responsibility for that belongs to the state. So he has simply articulated a series of different articles in that declaration to put it in that way, which makes it look significantly different to the neoliberal project. States, uh, he said, have the duty to cooperate with each other in ensuring development while maintaining full respect for civil and political as well as economic, social and cultural rights. Well, all of this throws up in particular some new ideas or challenging ideas in terms of the neoliberal agenda for the post-colonial state, the role of the post-colonial state, and there are very big ideological differences over the role of the state. Liberal ideology, particularly Western liberal ideology, views the state basically as an obstacle to individual and market freedoms. And that idea is backed by the doctrine of the IMF and the World Bank, largely a, a foreign investors club. In the West also, uh, on the left side of things, there, Western neo-Marxists, for example, often see the state as largely captured by dominant sections of capital. So a lot of, a lot of the left in Western countries doesn't really see the state as potentially uh, in the service of popular, the popular will, basically, or progressive forces, because it's captured. It's a capitalist state, and so there's a rather rigid view amongst a lot of Western leftists about the role of the state. But, um, and many of the ideas on human development don't really assist if we consider this uh, methodological individualism of Amartya Sen capability. It's about individual choices. That makes a lot of sense to economic liberals, and that was who Amartya Sen was talking to. Um, economic liberals, economists, who liked this idea of capability. It was more or less a, a smooth uh, relationship with the, the choices of, of economic liberalism. But even when capabilities are defined, the agency, how those things are to be carried out, is absent. As I said, the big debates in human development are really about the means rather than the aims. Now here we have a UN expert on uh, human rights and structural adjustment programs in the 90s, Professor Fantu Shera, who is a man from um, northeast Africa who is now, I think, um, I don't know if he's in North America or Europe, but he has an international profile and he said that the key problem of the structural adjustment programs, the World Bank IMF programs in the 90s was weakening the protective role of the state. That the state, he said, used to be a buffer to protect populations from the vagaries of this so-called international market, basically. That neoliberal globalism and interventionism constrain the possibility of strong independent political will and are hostile towards independent alliances. So here's the quote from Fantuchera from his report for the UN in 99 that the debt crisis, which is, was part and parcel of the, uh, the rationale for structural adjustment and the highly indebted poor countries initiative, it was used as a convenient excuse to open third world markets and curtail the role of the state in national development. The most crucial aspect of globalization and liberalization has been on the role of the state in national development. There are, I mentioned these deep differences over the role of the nation and the state. The, the state in post-colonial developing countries is often seen as potentially representing the popular will or broad social aspirations. Um, but in Western countries, in the European, in the US, the Australian experience, the state is less volatile. It's a more constant corporate agenda. Whereas the experiments with the state have been far more in post-colonial states where you had radical reforming governments, sometimes revolutionary governments in Guatemala, in Iran, in Chile, in Nicaragua, in Venezuela, for example. 
but big powers prefer weak and divided states on the one hand, but the post-colonial states need substantial strength and political will and allies if they're able to, one, assert democratic independence and form defensive alliances, two, build human capacity in the face of very strong pressures to privatise and um, allow unrestricted access of, of multinational corporations. Even simply to build mass education and public health systems requires sub substantial will. And thirdly, to defend international social support systems initiatives when they come under attack. So this is not possible really with weak, weak states in developing countries. One uh, challenge to this has come from uh, capitalist states, strong capitalist states themselves. The idea of a developmental state was um, coined really by a North American Chalmers Johnson to talk about the Japanese experience of successful economic development, post-war economic development, which was not neoliberal, it was very much coordinated through the state and the state with its um, a cabal effectively with large corporations which was copied in South Korea and then copied in Taiwan, Singapore and so on and to some extent you can say a similar type of uh, program in a more socialist or mixed economy uh, setting such as China um, can be drawn on for, for uh, with the same sort of correlations between or, or coordination between the state and large uh, business, for example. So it was initially an idea of talking about successful capitalist development. It was spoken of in the World Bank's uh, 1993 report, um, The East Asian Miracle, and that was controversial even at that time, even though it was talking about a successful capitalist country because it was challenging the, the North American view of things. And of course, the World Bank based in Washington is, was effectively um, an organ of US political agenda at that time. So Japan had to fund that report as Joseph Stiglitz points out. He used to be chief economist of the World Bank. The World Bank and the US side of things was so unhappy with that report, uh, even though it was a report of the World Bank that the Japanese funded it. Here's a brief uh, video on what is the developmental state, which sets out some of the elements I've been talking about. Developmental state or hard state is a term used by international political economy scholars to refer to the phenomenon of state-led macroeconomic planning in East Asia in the late 20th century. In this model of capitalism, sometimes referred to as state development capitalism, the state has more independent, or autonomous, political power, as well as more control over the economy. A developmental state is characterized by having strong state intervention, as well as extensive regulation and planning. The term has subsequently been used to describe countries outside East Asia which satisfy the criteria of a developmental state. Botswana, for example, has warranted the label since the early 1970s. The developmental state is sometimes contrasted with a predatory state or weak state. So what about the idea of a human development enabling state? If a strong state is needed to industrialize, to uh, create mass education and health programs um, like the, the state within the Indian Federation of Kerala, which um, it was a strong socialist state government that uh, enabled the introduction of universal and uh, education without fees so that poor people could access it. Uh, can this concept be expanded more to the point where a strong state which is often seen in Western terms as an enemy of individual freedom, um, can it be seen as a necessary counterforce to neoliberalism? Uh, it goes against many Western anarcho-syndicalist idea of the state as an enemy, but the use of political will to contain corporate demands and to invest heavily in human development is, I suggest, an important feature we should look for. It's been spoken of in relation to China these days, where on the one hand, you have substantial capitalist development in China, but you still have a socialist state and the socialist state is able to control to a certain extent the, the behavior of the very wealthy and maintain uh, strong social elements in, in the body politic there. We have also uh, an example of Venezuela, a mixed economy since 1999, which has reclaimed all resources and has a lot of internal conflict from these, the strong um, public sector process emerging, yet you still have a very strong private 
players that control a lot of the economy. A socially oriented political project, overtly anti-imperial, but facing repeated coup attempts and destabilizations, not only because of the outside pressure from the big power, but also because you have an internal um, capitalist sector, which is very hostile to the way in which things are moving. So to sum up, human capacity building is really at the root of the most successful development strategies, while resource extraction has proven a very poor substitute for that. Neoliberal globalism has placed serious constraints on public education, public health, food security, equal access to water, labor rights, a range of things. The Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals put in some very important human development aims to the idea of development and development strategy, but with increasingly neoliberal or corporate methods from rebadging privatizations to partnerships and talking about keeping in the WTO's, WTO rule-based ideas and a single rule for all countries and the enhancement of strong patents and so on, those sorts of things borrowed from previous neoliberal projects and put into particularly the sustainable development goals of 2015. There are, however, new opportunities for independent strategy in the multipolar world. That is to say, the very thing that the US is fighting against with its all its wars in the Middle East and its interventions in Latin America, it is very worried about the idea of new poles of power, new independent power blocks and alliances being created and diminishing its influence in the world. So in this context, the role of the state um, is very important. We have on one hand the neoliberal view of a minimal state versus the stronger role of a developmental state, which is really uh, becoming increasingly necessary in the post-colonial world. Very weak states, which pretend to be independent, are being wiped out very easily. Development strategy in small nation best practice involves conserving physical resources, managing it carefully, building political will, building alliances, and investing in people. We've seen investing in human capacity is really at the root of pretty much all the best development strategies.